Hey, Rails, how's everybody doing? Come on, who's happy to be here today? Man, I'm so pumped. Come on, who's happy to be here? All right. I am uh, so uh, grateful that each of you decided to make God a priority today. I want to give a shout out to those who are joining us online, whether you're traveling or you're spring breaking, behave yourself out there. And, uh, and also those just missionaries we support and people in different communities around the world. We love you guys. Can we give a really warm welcome to everybody who's joining with us online? Come on. We love you guys so much. And so we, we call ourselves One House with Many Rooms and our campus in uh, downtown Greeley and in Rio de Janeiro at Botafogo and that small, uh, in that community. It's a beautiful part of the world, by the way. Uh, both of those uh, campuses, they have their own thing going on right now. And so you get me. And so I'm going to share with you guys, uh, I called an audible, actually. I'll explain why in just a minute. Called an audible in the order of the messages. You, if you see those five uh, messages, those titles, the very last one is never give up. That doesn't mean we're going to stop the series. We're not going to give up. We're going to go, to, we're going to, actually, we're going to switch the order. Uh, and the reason is next week, uh, the name of the message is have fun. How many, how many couples know what I'm talking about when I say have fun? Okay. And so, because uh, I didn't give you any notice that, that that message will be, I mean, just barely PG-13, but PG-13, uh, we're going to be talking about sex. And, and the thing is, if your kids are too young, they probably don't need to hear about it just yet. And if they're older, like teenagers, they don't want to hear a 46 year old out of shape guy talk about <laughs> I'm going to be providing air sickness bags for my own children next week. And so anyway, it's going to be one of those. But I wanted to give you seven days notice. So we switched the order for that reason. You guys are welcome. And so, so today we're going to talk about never give up. Everybody say never give up. All right. Now, Amy and I have been married 25 years. November 16th was our 25th wedding anniversary. <clears throat> Amy is a saint. And uh, anyway, but uh, there are a couple things that we uh, committed to, I mean, at the very beginning of our marriage. And these two things, listen, I've made mistakes. I'm not going to say Amy has, because uh, if I said Amy had a mistake, made a mistake, that'd be another mistake on my part. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so I'm, I've made mistakes. We've made mistakes. But, uh, but there are two things that we've really, uh, that we found to be bedrock in our marriage. The first thing that we've never even questioned is God's goodness and faithfulness. Now, does that mean everything that happens to us is desirable or controllable or preferred? Absolutely not. But no matter what we've faced as a couple in our family, in our own lives, whatever, um, we have never, we, we just know this. Let me say it this way. We are not qualified to call balls and strikes on God. His ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. He's up to something we can't understand. And so no matter what we've been through, we've just never questioned God's goodness and his faithfulness in our lives. The other thing that we've never even discussed, we, we, just, we just haven't. We've never said uh, divorce. You know, like when we're, we're in conflict or anything like that, we've never talked about spending time apart or anything like that. We just, we just don't go there. Now, that does not mean if something is really, really broken, uh, that that can't be something that you deal with in counseling or something like that. But I'm just telling you, in our marriage, those two things have been bedrock. Now, I'm going to tell you, uh, one of the things I tell my wife, babe, you may try to leave me, but if you do, I'm coming with you. <laughs> okay. Now, why would we be talking about never give up? Some of you guys are in your dating years and you're like, why would I ever want to give up? I'm in love. I mean, she's pretty. He's pretty. You know, it's whatever. It's like, what? what? But I mean, yeah, I mean, they're different than I am, but, but that's alluring. It's mysterious. I mean, I don't know why she keeps bringing up something I did wrong six months ago, but, I, but I'm sure over time that will become less annoying. <laughs> I don't know why he, he <clears throat> watches game after game after game when I like to have a conversation, but over time, I'm sure that will just be part of the fabric of our life and be fine. The reality is in marriage, sometimes opposites attract. Yes? Um, in the dating years, that can be fun. In the dating years, opposites can attract. But in the marriage years, opposites attack. Okay? It's like, man, I thought that was charming, and now it is just annoying. All right? And we are different. We're different from each other. Some people, they, they 
plan their life, very disciplined, show up to everything a couple minutes early. Early is on time, on time is late. You know anybody like that? You know, just very regimented. They just have their, their life together. And then you have the creative, usually the other partner, just the creative person that just wants to float in and out of life. And, and in church, those are the people that just, I just follow the Holy Spirit. There he is. Oh, he's over here now. Well, then why did you do that? Don't worry about it. He's over here now. And we need those creatives because it makes life beautiful. But some of you creatives, you, you just need to go ahead and like get a day planner. Like you need, you need to make sense sometimes. And so this is really alluring in the dating years. In married life, it gets a little bit tough. Or what about the money issue? Uh, in the first service today, I talked about one of you is relatively a bigger spender than the other one. And this woman immediately said, it's him. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> and then some of you are relatively the saver. Let me talk to savers for a minute. How many of you savers are just shocked that since COVID, how many Amazon packages just keep coming to your, <laughs> your front stoop? It's like, it, what, how many people are ordering? What do they need? It's like, well, I need, I need more shoes. You have 78 pairs of shoes. Yes, but I don't have those. Anyway, over time, that becomes a value rift uh, that can create tension. Uh, some of you, uh, this is a really minor disagreement. We talk about pancakes that are thin versus thick, but I, I have to get something off my chest. I, I've been here 12 years as your pastor, and it's about time for you to bring this up. I have a strong conviction on the dimension of the squares and waffles. I think Belgian waffles are stupid. What has Belgium ever contributed? God bless America. Come on, what has Belgium ever, these massive squares, it's just, it just, it's like a death trap for just too much butter. It's like, I like the waffle house size and if you don't know what Waffle House size squares are in a waffle, then you're too rich. <laughs> I have a Waffle House body. I want Waffle House. I don't understand this, but some of you don't, don't seem very passionate about it, as I clearly am. The point is, these differences over time, they can seem small at first and become a bigger deal over time, which leads to a different opposite. And that is, we start out in love, and then it's like, you know what, we're going to divorce court. Now, before we get into all the, the scripture and everything about, about uh, endurance and about commitment and covenant, we'll talk about covenant in just a minute. I, I want to say something to a group of you in the room. Some of you within the context of marriage, you have been victims of abuse and you, have, you left the marriage for your safety, maybe for your mental health. I did not realize until I moved to Colorado that this is a controversial statement for a pastor to make. And I, I, I don't say that with disrespect. I this is controversial, and so I, I will get the emails, I know. But I am not going to stand before God and say, I made a man or a woman stay in an abusive marriage. Okay, people will say, well, the Bible says the only reason you get a divorce is because of unfaithfulness. I'm just not going to tell someone who's getting battered that they need to get back in there. So, so I, apparently here that's controversial. Now, where I'm from, and, and honestly, uh, being pretty familiar with abuse, I just, I just, that's just not something I can, in, in good conscience, can support. So, so where does the Bible say you can leave over physical abuse or emotional abuse? Every verse of Scripture about marriage, except the stuff about divorce, is what says that part. So, if you are a victim of abuse, you don't need to be told by me to stick it out. You need to be told by me to get help, to get out, to call law enforcement. I know it's, I, I understand this is challenging. <clears throat> I understand this is challenging for some people, but, but uh, I just, I, it's important for you to be, to understand where we're, where we're coming from on this. And so, so maybe you've been a victim of abuse. You had to get out. Maybe you cheated. Maybe you, uh, you know, it's like, actually I lost a marriage. I got divorced and it was my fault. Maybe you were totally faithful and you did everything you possibly could to make the marriage work and you still uh, went through the pain of divorce. And so whatever, whatever that is, whatever your past is, there's a reason. First, let me say, there's no judgment for you in this house. Hopefully, no matter what your walk of life, you will find support and love and care 
okay? <clears throat> but if you have gone through divorce, that's the reason this series is called From This Day Forward. You and I can't go back in time and change the past, but we can from this moment forward. So you know what? I'm going to live the way God's called me to live. I'm going to do relationships the way God's called me to. Does that make sense? So I know it's a little heavy, but I just wanted to put that out there as clearly as I can. I don't apologize for my stance on that. And, and if you're offended, then, you know, you just need Jesus. <laughs> With that said, Matthew 19, some Pharisees came to Jesus to test him and they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Now, why would Pharisees be coming to test Jesus? Why, what qualifies them to test the Son of God? Uh, arrogance. And you can tell the difference between healthy spiritual community and Pharisees, which is unhealthy spiritual community, because healthy spiritual community, is all, they'll challenge you, they'll push on you, but it's to make you better. There's mercy involved. There's dignity involved. There's, you, you are... You are called to something better than this. God has, God's not called you a liar or broken or a victim. He's called you uh, more than a conqueror. It's like that, that redemptive spirit is where you get, you can tell healthy spiritual community because there's a strong redemptive uh, element to it. Whereas the Pharisees are playing gotcha, uh, you did this, and so that makes you this, and, and that kind of thing. And so that's what we're seeing here. Pharisees came to Jesus to test him. Uh, very arrogant. And they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And Jesus says, haven't you read? He replied that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. What God has put together, let people not break apart. Now I'm going to tell you something. Uh, my siblings, they both uh, had previous marriages, divorced, and then married to their current spouses. Um, my, my parents were divorced before my mom died. Uh, people in my community, and I bet all of you know somebody. There's somebody close to you, maybe it's you. You've gone through this horrific, painful experience called divorce. And if you know anything about, or if you've read anything about studies having to do with stress and pain, that surrounds divorce, it's almost as intense as the death of a loved one. Now, something you may not know <clears throat> is that the suicide rate during a, a, in, in a divorce process, the suicide rate is nine times higher in men than in women with divorce. And uh, so the point is, it's just, it's just horrific for everyone involved. But why is it so horrific? Okay. Why, why did those people that you know that have been divorced or when you went through it, it felt like you were being ripped apart? And I believe it's because when you got married, God did something miraculous and he, and he made two people one person. And so when you break that apart, it, the, that ripping, that, that feeling is, is we are unwanting ourselves. Does that make sense? And, and I think just that alone ought to be proof of this. We obviously have scripture to back this up too, but that's proof that marriage is more than a contract. Okay? In fact, a contract is based on mutual distrust. A contract limits my responsibilities and increases my rights. When you rent a house or rent a car or buy something significant. Lots of times when, when you get into business with someone, you are signing sometimes stacks uh, of legalese, of, of, of language that is designed to protect you so that you can also enforce that the other person is going to keep their word. You guys hear what I'm saying? That's a contract. It's like, I'm going to limit my exposure and I'm going to beef up my rights, okay? Okay. That's what a prenup is. So if you're dating and you propose and then you're like, but before we get married, I would like to sign a document, a uh, contract that allows me to keep my hunting camp. I put a lot of work into that Chevy. You know, so what? I love those golf clubs. Whatever it is, that ought to be a red flag. Now, there might be some very rare instances where something like that seems like the right idea. I'm not trying to judge it as, a, and it's, but most of the time, 
If you're already operating from a place of distrust, you guys hear what I'm saying? It's like, hey, then that shows, I think that show, should show you that you're coming from a contractual standpoint versus a covenantal standpoint. A covenant is based on mutual commitment. A covenant is permanent. A covenant doesn't, is not just uh, undermined on a technicality. It's a till death do us part kind of thing. In fact, the, the root word of covenant means cutting. You guys remember those old movies or maybe when you were younger before you realized how gross this was? People would cut their hands and we'd like become blood, blood brothers, you know? It's like, you're crazy. You're, you know, what is happening? But that is literally what covenant, the, the root word of that means cut. It means that we're, we're gonna intermingle that, that life force in us to becoming one. Don't do that, okay? Uh, but that's the reason we make these really strong commitments when we, when we get married. It's like to have and hold from this day forward as long as we both shall live. Um, you guys remember Billy Graham? His wife, Ruth, was interviewed by somebody. Uh, just what's it like to live with this legend and be married to him? And there's this question that came and said, have you ever considered divorcing Billy Graham? And Ruth said, no, I've never once considered divorcing him. I, I've considered murder a number of times. <laughs> but never divorce. Okay. <laughs> well, but pastor, I'm just not happy anymore. I just don't love her. I don't love him anymore. It's like, well, this, this may sound a little dumb, but I think it's important to say. Getting divorced because you ran out of love is like selling your car because you ran out of gas. Now, these days, with the price of gas, it's becoming a less compelling argument. <laughs> We're making payments either way. Somebody say amen. <laughs> okay. We, we run out of love. We run out of grace. We run out of patience. We, we run out. But God never does. And it's so important for us to, when we, when we get to that place where we're depleted and we run out of margin, to go to God who doesn't get exhausted, who always has margin. And then to step back into that marriage relationship, having built ourselves up. You guys hear what I'm saying? Okay. And if we want to go the distance, if we want to say, you know what, I'm never going to give up. One of the really healthy ways we can do that is to start really focusing on the areas where we are responsible, where we have some control. A lot of times when marriages start to get a little thin in the grace department, we start to focus a whole lot on what the other person's responsibilities are. But right now, I want to talk to you about <clears throat> your responsibility by talking about sowing and reaping in marriage. How many of you know that's a principle? That's a real thing. Okay, in fact, the Bible says, don't lie to yourself. Don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A, a man or a person reaps what they sow. They reap what they sow. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time. We will reap a harvest, say this with me, if we do not give up. If we do not give up. I want to unpack uh, this idea of sowing and reaping. First of all, you do reap what you sow. Have you ever seen somebody that they walk into a room and I mean, it's like they just listened to 78 messages from Joel Osteen. They're just so happy. It's like they just light up the room. They're the thermostat for the emotional temperature. It's like they just come in and it's like, man, I'm happier because you're here. Ever been around somebody like that? And they're just like, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love love. Man, love is great. It's just lovely. And then you have other kinds of people, they walk in and it's like all they can do not to flip you off. It's like, hey, you just had a birthday. Did you have a great party? I mean, I guess it was all right. I got like a hundred things that I wanted, but there was one thing I really wanted I didn't get. I don't know why my friends hate me. You know what I mean? It's like, what kind of, what kind of seeds are you sowing in your life? And when you walk in with, with even those affects, you're sowing into your environment. A lot of times we don't realize that. We, we're kind of nose blind to our own affect. 
But, but what we do, and sometimes we don't see our effect on other people. Are you guys getting anything out of this? What we do sows seeds that will then come back. So if we're grateful, if we're positive, if we're merciful, that stuff comes back. But if we're critical and controlling and complaining, then that stuff comes back too. Now, I want to say this specifically about women. And this can be true in certain ways about everybody, but I'll make a point specific to women. And that is women are multipliers. Now, follow me here, because this is becoming more and more controversial. But I'm a rebel. (laughs) Amy, my wife, is a woman. (laughs) When we got married, there was just two of us. Over time, we multiplied. We'll talk about that next week. Now, there's six of us and a daughter-in-law, and then that daughter-in-law is in our family because my son also married a woman. And then they multiplied, now there's four of them. The reason we multiplied, follow me here, this is because I married a woman. I thought that was funny. I thought it was funny. Anyway, but it's also very true. So guys, why do I bring this up? Because women are multipliers. If you don't like what you are getting from your wife, then you might need to take inventory of what you are giving your wife. Okay? If you are sowing respect, you'll get respect. If you sow listening, you'll get listening. Or even better than listening, listening and then expressing, I hear you. I appreciate what you're saying. I appreciate the trust for you to say that to me. A lot of times what we sow is, I'm just waiting for you to shut up so I can make my next point. (laughs) And you're going to get that back. But if you and I sow listening and understanding and first seeking to understand, then to be understood, that'll come back. Yes? So you reap what you sow. You also reap where you sow. I was raised around the Louisiana Delta, very rich agricultural area. <clears throat> and again, this is not, shouldn't be controversial, I don't think it is, but a lot of farming. And, and I noticed that farmers tend to sow seed in their own farm land. I'll just, I can tell you don't get it yet. It'd be a little creepy, actually, if a farmer in the middle of the night just, I don't know what crop they want, but let me go ahead and just put some seed in there. Why do I bring this up? If I want a tree here, I'm going to plant here. Okay? So, if you sow your energy, your effort, your enthusiasm into your hobbies then your hobbies are probably going to take off and be super fun and you'll be real good at it. But your marriage still may suffer. If you sow your energy and effort and learning and enthusiasm into your career or your business, like I got to provide for my family. Yep, I understand that. But you can be very successful in business and career and still your marriage can suffer. Moms and dads, you spend all of your energy and your time making sure that you're, you know, you're investing in your kids. And that just seems like, man, that's my calling. Yes, and so is your marriage. And if you sell a whole bunch in your kids, you probably have great kids, but your marriage can suffer. And a lot of times during that, the, that season of life, intimacy can be uh, kind of, there can be a lot of tension there, a lot of neglect that happens, and then your kids leave home and then you're living with a stranger. You guys hear what I'm saying? So it's important to know this. You reap where you sow. Your spouse, that's your, God is our one, our spouses are two. So invest the most in that relationship. Okay? Pastor, I know all this. Yes, I know. (laughs) And if you would just start doing it, I could preach much more interesting messages. (laughs) But you won't behave yourselves. So I will keep preaching stuff you already know. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Our marriages are as good as we decide they're going to be. 
Okay. So, if I don't, some of us are like, yeah, but I don't feel like it. I don't feel like it. I know it could be, but I just don't feel like it. I'm always the one that, I do the work. I'm always the one who forgives. I just, I don't feel like doing more work. I don't feel like forgiving. It's their turn. I don't feel like being nice. Have you ever figured out, figured out over the years, you know the shortcuts that your spouse will let you take? One of my favorite seasons of life was when Amy uh, was breastfeeding our, our kids when they were uh, 13 years old. Just kidding, just newborns. And um, <laughs> that was funny. Come on, somebody. That was funny. And I only said that to you guys. You're my favorite group all morning. But I love that because in the middle of the night, when our little uh, babies would start crying, guess who had to get up? I just, oh, babe, I wish I could feed our kids. I'm just, I'm just not equipped. I can feel the anger and the hatred right now. But how many, come on, guys, you know what I'm talking about. You're like, yeah, I'll let him take the hit, but I'm really glad for that too. <laughs> what I'm saying is there are times when you're just exhausted, when you're at the end of all your margin. It's like, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like it. But how many other areas of life can you make this excuse? What if Amy had said, I don't feel like feeding the baby? Well, we'd go to jail. <laughs> or what if, what if we said, I don't feel like working? Although more and more people are beginning to say this. <laughs> a little sad, a little scary. I don't feel like working, I won't. Or I don't feel like paying my taxes. It just doesn't work anywhere else in life. You guys hear what I'm saying? Let's do what's right. Now, when we talk about never giving up, please hear that this is so much more than just saying, don't you get a divorce. That's really not, if, if the only commitment you walk away uh, in life, you walk through life with in your marriage is, I'm just not gonna get the divorce. That's a pretty thin, it could be noble, maybe you stay married your whole life. That's still a pretty thin commitment. Because what I'm actually trying to say is much, much more robust than just, just don't get divorced. It's actually this. Never stop seeking God together. Never stop fighting fair. In other words, conflict, which we talked about last week, conflict is so that we can learn something from each other, not so that we can win. We talk about never giving up. We're talking about we're not going to stop seeking God. We're, we're not going to stop fighting fair. We're going to keep having fun. We're going to stay pure. And, and those are the things we're not going to quit doing. Because if you'll do that, you'll reap a harvest. Now I want to talk to you for the last couple of minutes. What, is, what does it look like? What, what is the vision here? What is the harvest? So Amy and I, as I said earlier, married 25 years. And four beautiful kids. We have six kids. Four of them are beautiful. I'm just kidding. We have four kids. Only four kids. And they're all... I'm just making sure you're paying attention. Some of you guys are starting to like get the... Preachers know the face. Okay, my oldest, Nathan, he and his wife and their two kids just moved to Jackson Hole, um, Wyoming. And, and so when they come back to town, they're part of this too. And up until just a couple weeks ago, part of this every Sunday, we have something called family night. Amy started this. And we don't have to like, you need to come to family night. They love family night. Our kids love family night. And what happens about five or six in the evening, everybody comes over. We have some great food, usually uh, super noisy because there can be as many as like 14 of us. Uh, me and Amy, our four kids, my daughter-in-law, their two kids, Joshua and Emily and their three beautiful kids. And it's, it's noisy, it's chaotic. Sometimes I just wanna go to my room and ask God to, turn down the volume in the entire world, you know? It's like, it could just be, but, but it's beautiful. And our kids love us and watching them honor Amy, love Amy, watching them honor and love me, watching them most of the time honor and love each other. And then these kids, you know, Johnny runs in the house and, and, I, and, I, and he loves me so much. He comes up to me and he says, dumb, dumb. because he wants those little suckers. Uh, anyway, I, I buy his affection, but 
But my point is, my point is like, it's our families there. And, and I know every year this will get richer and better and stronger and more beautiful. One of the things I've said for a long time as your pastor is live in such a way in your youth that life gets better through the years instead of living in such a way in your youth that you're filled with regret in your later years. A harvest is rich with family and love and, and togetherness and legacy. And our kids, they don't question God's goodness and faithfulness either. And my prayer is that every single one of you, with every year, that your harvest, harvest will grow richer and better and stronger. Let us not become weary in the moments. Because at the proper time, for us, it's 25 years in and it's already so rich. At the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. Amen? I was glad you came to church today. What I want to do right now is speak to a group of you in the room. You know you're not right with God and you want to get right with God today. If that's you, I want to pray for you right where you sit. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way, but I would like to know who I'm praying for. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm the only one looking around. We are so thankful you were able to join us today. Before we wrap up our worship experience, I want to give you an opportunity to take that first step in starting a personal relationship with Jesus. If you want to take that step, just pray this prayer along with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I have sinned and have lived life my own way, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In your name, amen. If you made that decision and prayed that prayer with me today, we would love to follow up with you to give you next steps on your spiritual journey. Just follow the link in the description that says, I made the decision to follow Jesus. The best next step for anyone who has made a decision to follow Jesus is to get plugged into a healthy community. And we would love for that to be Res Church. We'd also invite you to check out our Growth Track 7 Minute Start. If you've never gone through Growth Track, it is now an easy and on-demand process that you can experience at your own pace, wherever you are and whenever you want. This is a great way that we can help you discover the purpose that God has created you for and how you can use that purpose to make a difference in the world. You can find the link for Growth Track in the description of this video. You will also find links to follow us on social media, visit our website, connect with us, or request prayer. Thank you again for joining us today. We hope to connect with you soon, and we will see you again next week for church in person or online.